our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the deadly sin of anger and life giving words, Father, forgive. These are words again from our text. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. When was the last time you were angry? And is it a sin? Reformation Day, October 31st, 1979, Henry Fairley wrote a book entitled The Seven Deadly Sins Today. 1979. Some of you were not alive in 1979. Listen to what Henry said. He said, back then, we live in an age of wrath. It is found in the terrorist, the kidnapper, the looter, and the clenched fist of the demonstrator. 1979? What comes around, goes around? Things haven't changed much, have they? Terrorists. I don't know who was behind the Jewish cemetery overthrow of those gravestones. But it's terrorism of some kind, isn't it? It's a hatred towards some particular kind of people. And there are terrorists still in the world. We see that day in and day out on the news. How about kidnappers? Are kidnapping still going on? I'm old enough to remember a time when we did not have Amber Alerts. I'm glad we got them. You realize most often what happens when there's an Amber Alert? Somebody in one family wants that child. Not able to work it out in court, they go to the extreme of kidnapping. And what about looters? Why weren't volunteers allowed into some of the area around Perryville? The night that the tornado struck, Wayne Shrimp went to help out. He couldn't get in. The next day, he sat in Perryville for two hours in his truck, not able to go and help someone else. Why? Two reasons chaos. And that happens every time there's a disaster like that. And secondly, they have not yet established how to get people in and out who are going to help. Don't blame anyone, okay? It's chaos. Be glad that people are responding. Be glad that you and I have an opportunity also to respond in some way. Looters still take place. Remember Katrina? New Orleans? How much looting took place then? There was a time when I grew up on a farm when we never locked our door. Matter of fact, you couldn't lock it anyway. It was broken. <clears throat> we never had to worry. How about you? You lock the doors this day? Every night, except last night, I don't know why, every night before I go to bed, I go in and check and make sure the garage door is down. If I don't, someone will call me. The neighbor would say, you know your garage door is open? I always unlock the inside. I always lock the inside of the garage door. And then I step out and I check that door to the front entrance. How about you? Checking your doors? Would that be necessary if we all follow the Ten Commandments? Wherever we are? Some here might be thinking, Pastor, way to go. Take them on. Let them have it. Well, let's go back to our text just for a minute. What does it say? Listen closely. Everyone, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Uh, that everyone includes you, by the way. And includes me. One of the temptations of preaching a sermon series on the seven deadly sins is people don't want to hear about them. You know why, don't you? You actually might be involved in sin. And by the way, you are. I heard this from a pastor not too long ago. I thought it was a great idea. The pastor came in the middle of church on Sunday morning and he stood up before the church and says, I want you to know I'm a terrible sinner. They all looked at him. What's he going to say? And then he said, so are you. So are you. No one here is without sin. Remember what Jesus said? The one without sin can cast the first stone. Go ahead, have at it. Before you catch one, the preacher, you might want to consider your own life as well. I'm just thinking about it. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. How old does one have to be to become angry? Do you know why we call the terrible two and the horrible fours? The two-year-old fours, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You were that one time. I'm a twin. My mother used to call us double trouble. 
<laughs> Where one was, the other one was. And quite often we were in trouble. Now, that was back when corporal punishment was still a possibility. We had our backside warm just once or twice. Well, maybe a little bit more often than that. How about teenagers slamming the doors on their way to the room after being told something they wanted to do was denied? Ever do that? I remember someone in my family, I won't use names, not my wife, one of the kids, when they were small, about the age of 10 to 12, slammed that door when they went to their room. I got the last word. They had to stay in there for a while. Husbands and wives, when was the last time you were angry? Did you ever get the silent treatment? You know what it is, don't you? The other person not talking? Maybe there's a reason why we need to understand what that silent treatment is all about. Someone said this once, most of us talk more than we listen, or before we listen. I will have to admit, my type A personality sometimes gets me in trouble because I speak, and I'm into the next world before the other person is. So just hang in there with me. Get rid of anger. Most often, anger begins with some kind of what I would call trash talk, isn't it? Just watch football games or baseball games or any sport and it starts out with somebody against somebody else using trash talk. And they even at one time or another will talk about somebody else's mother. Oh, I'm not kidding, am I? And before long, there's a bench emptying brawl. Maybe it's a pitch thrown at somebody else's team. You get the idea, don't you? Everybody gets into the act. And then there's pushing and shoving until the response requires an apology. And some apologies are true and some are not. The scriptures are full of stories about individuals who are angry. Cain and Abel. Cain's offering wasn't looked upon with as much favor as Abel's. It didn't mean his offering wasn't looked upon as in being good, but it wasn't quite the same level as his brother. So Cain was very angry, and the scriptures say his face was downcast. Maybe there's a clue in there that we need to remember in our own lives. Have you ever been downcast? Has your face ever shown your anger? Perhaps we need to come face to face with our own face, so to speak. The next time you think of becoming angry, go look in the mirror. Would you be happy with that face? Now, I know what some of you are going to be tempted to do. Don't do this. Don't say to the person, go look in the mirror. You want to see your face. What you've done now is add another stick to the fire. Don't be surprised if you get a different response. <coughs> Maybe we can identify with Moses in our own Testament reading today. God told Moses to speak to the rock. Moses was angry with the people, and he took on more than he should have, and he struck the rock. For that reason, he was not allowed to enter the promised land. Oh, he saw it from afar, but he did not get to go in. Not until the transfiguration of Christ invited him, God invited him back to stand there with Moses, with uh, Elijah, in the Old Testament prophet. Isn't it interesting, in the midst of that Old Testament story, Moses was angry, and yet God, in his grace, gave them water? Isn't that the way he is with us as well? Even when we commit the sin of anger, he doesn't give up on us? His compassion to new every morning? Perhaps we can identify with Moses. We can anger someone else. Perhaps we don't strike out with our fists, but we certainly strike out with words. I attended a workshop once, and they said this. I thought it was really good about marriage and relationships with others. I words in, I words in form, you words in flame. Sound familiar? You talk to someone else and use the word you. You didn't put the dishes away the way I want you to. Doesn't happen in my family because I'm not that good at putting them away. <laughs> and after that, you come home, perhaps somebody from work, and say, well, you know, you didn't pick up the stuff I told you to. And then we say, well, wait a minute, you didn't tell me, I don't remember that. We had another log to the fire, and pretty soon the fire's so big we can't put it out. Remember, you words in flame, my words in form. Try it, see if that helps. We can go on and on, particularly during Lent, and especially Holy Week. <coughs> Judas was angry because the money wasn't being spent the way he wanted to spend. He became
betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver to be paid for being angry. Jesus wasn't doing what he wanted. And so he took hands and he took matters in his own hands. After he was arrested, was, was Christ taken quietly from the Garden of Gethsemane? You know the answer. Pilate's soldiers, they mocked and insulted him. They struck him and said, who hit you? If you're the Son of God, get yourself down off the cross. They would yell and scream, crucify him, crucify him. Angrily, they would ask for his life and take away Barabbas, the one who was indeed an insurrectionist. Amazingly, Jesus Christ, the victim of deadly anger, speaks words of life. He suffered psychological abuse. How often did people reject him, even before Holy Week? He suffered scourging. He suffered beating. He suffered thorns. He suffered nails. And the anger was literally deadly. And yet, aren't those, a lot of times we hear the words, and yet, in scriptures, especially when it comes to God, and yet, Christ prays life-giving words. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. For whom did Jesus pray? Was it not his accusers? Was it not Pilate and Herod? Was it not the soldiers? Was it not all those who would flee, including the disciples? Was it not Peter? For those who would deny him, for his disciples, for you and me. One commentator puts it this way. We do not fully know what we do, how great is our sin, how our anger hurts people. And yet, Christ prayed for us. Think about it just for a minute. Father, forgive them. Whose father was he? Whose father is he? Because of Christ. When do you pray, our Father in heaven? Whose father is he? Who is your brother? Your brother, Jesus Christ, prayed for you. And he prayed for you when you committed the sin of anger. Father, he says, <coughs> you need to read behind the line. Father, forgive. Send their sins away. Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. On the Old Testament day of atonement, there were two goats taken away from the crowd of goats. One goat was offered on the, sac on the altar of sacrifice for the high priest's sins and for the sins of the people, and the other goat was sent away into the wilderness. So people can actually visually see their sins going away. They can see forgiveness face to face in the goat. How about you? I encourage you today, look at the statue. Look at the statue of Jesus. Come face to face with his face towards you. It's a forgiving face. Look at the cross. Come face to face with the instrument of his death and your life. Look at the bread and wine this morning in communion. Come face to face with Christ's body and blood given for you. Finally, come face to face on how to face anger. Someone taught me this a long time ago. It does work if you try it. All you have to remember is the ABCD method of handling anger. Here it comes. A. Accept anger as a part of our fallen nature. Anger is going to happen. It does. B. Be aware of how it affects you physically. I still remember my boss when I was a director of nursing in the hospital. Neat guy, a Christian man, but I knew when he was angry. I thank God he wasn't angry with me. But I remember one day his ears got bright red. I mean bright red. And he had anger over somebody who really mishandled his job. How does anger affect you physically? Does your voice get louder? Or do you get real quiet? Be aware of how it affects you physically. C. Create time and space between you and what's causing the anger. If you're angry at someone else, back up a little bit. Back off a little bit. Create time and space between you and the anger. And then D, do something constructive. When I thought about that last night, I thought about, you know what the most constructive thing you can do when you're angry? Pray to God for help. Face your anger. Say, Lord, help me deal with this anger. And you know what he'll do? He'll help you deal with it. So I hope today you've come face to face with anger. You know where to take it. 
and you know where to leave it, and then you leave, seeking not to be angry with others, but putting yourself in the hands of Jesus Christ, who goes with you. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, life everlasting. But amen, though, sometime when they have their youth service, right? That's great. Glad to have you here. Your name is Nevaeh. No, your name is Delaney. I was close. Remember, I'm 71 years old. Okay? I brought some things with me today that you might know what they are and then you might not. Uh, let me see. I'll start with these. Okay, do you know what these are? Shoes. Shoes. What kind of shoes are they? Hiking shoes. These are called hiking boots or hiking shoes. Okay? Hiking boots. Hiking boots. That's right. These are... I'm not going to say those. What are these? Oh, you're good, Nicole. These are water shoes. These are used when you get into a river or you go across. I like to call it a creek. Some of you call it a creek. It's really a creek. Okay? Let's get that right. All right? And you notice they've been used a lot. I lived in Tennessee and I used to go kayaking. And I didn't want to get my feet all grungy from the bottom of the lake, so I put on my water shoe. Okay? It was muddy and it was rocky. And it was... Okay, what are these? Sleeping shoes, that's what they are, right? I sit in my recliner after church, watch golf this afternoon, and I sleep in a sleeping shoe. What are they, Nicole? What do you call these? Slippers. Now, what do these three things have in common? They're all shoes of sorts, that's one thing. What else? Huh? They protect my feet. What else? You're a child, you can answer that one, yes. How about they all belong to me? Right? They all belong to me. You got shoes on, you got boots on, and they all belong to you, right? But these are also, these are Jesus shoes. What? How can they be Jesus shoes? Well, you see, I belong to Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for my sins, and he died for your sins, for everybody's sins. And guess what? You all, regardless of the size of shoes this morning, you have Jesus shoes on. And what does that mean? Because God loves us so much, he sent his son to die for us, we want to go out and wear these Jesus shoes wherever we are, wherever we go. So when you go back home, you put on your Jesus shoes. And you act like you think Jesus would want you to act. I think that's fantastic, don't you? We all got Jesus shoes on this morning. Wear your shoes around. I'm going to teach you another song. I like Sunday school. I'm going to learn this song. Well, no, you can't sing it. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> and it goes like this. Maybe some of you have heard it. Raise your hand if you know the song when I start singing. Okay, are you ready? Do you know, O oh Christian, you're a sermon and shoes? Do you know, O oh Christian, you're a sermon and shoes? Jesus counts upon you to share the gospel news. Do you know, O oh Christian, you're a sermon and shoes? Okay, be a sermon. 